I'm Chris Nessie, host of Behind the Mic, Voices of the EPN, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Steve here, and today I'm talking with David Wakefield, and he's the founder and chief executive officer of SIBME. We're focused on the role AI, coupled with coaching, can play in the classroom. (laughs) Oh, what a cool cool episode. You're going to learn so much. Thanks for listening. And oh, by the way, before you go anywhere, it'd be so cool if you went to my website, stephenmaletto.com slash reviews and uh, left a review. Could you do that for me? That would be so nice. You are awesome. Enjoy the show. Hey, I recently was interviewed by Chris Nessie, the founder of EPN. EPN is the Education Podcast Network. He has a podcast called The House of Ed Tech on there, and he also has his podcast called Behind the Mic. Behind the Mic is where he interviews the other podcasters on EPN. That's right. He uh, talks to us about, uh, you know, why we made the podcast, why we stuck with it, what happened along the way, what equipment we use, what we learned that uh, from mistakes and what we learned from just by doing. And uh, it's pretty cool. And you get to hear from all of us. So uh, good stuff. I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, I hope you go sh- listen to it as well as share it with a friend. That'd be so cool. Thanks. To me, uh, you know, sharing that classroom with that master teacher for an entire year, I was just blown away and I learned so much and it completely transformed how I taught literacy, how I taught writing. And uh, had I not had that experience, I likely would have been teaching similarly uh, in my ninth year uh, as I did in my first few years. It's the education podcast, your favorite show, with lots of groovy guests and they share what they know. So crank it up to 10 and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Miletto. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Ah, uh, ah, uh, with Dr. Steve Miletto. David Wakefield is the founder and chief executive officer of SIBME. A former educator, Dave believes that with the right support and tools, teachers and school administrators can collaborate with each other to solve their own problems organically. David, welcome, and thanks so much for joining me. Say hello to everyone. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Maletto. It's great to be here. Well, glad to have you here, and uh, let's let's do this for just a second. Uh, Tell us a little bit about you, and then we're going to talk about Sydney. So what what makes you tick? What uh, what makes David... uh, who David is. Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, well, I grew up uh, in North Dakota, so uh, a small community. Uh, that's something a little bit interesting about me uh, in my background. Um, so I grew up in a smaller community, uh, a, a more rural state. Uh, so in terms of just my upbringing, um, now, I now live in the big city of Houston. I've been here since 2004. So uh, I've kind of now lived in sort of the rural and sort of urban worlds. Uh, so obviously different perspectives uh, growing up in a state like North Dakota and then moving to a huge cosmopolitan city like Houston. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I went to college in, in, in Minnesota, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, and um, and then made my way down to Texas in 2004. But uh, uh I, I, I enjoy Texas uh, outside of the summer months, but uh, <laughs> but uh, you could say the same in North Dakota. I enjoy the summer uh, outside the winter months. So, uh, bo- so I can say I've, I, I live in extreme locations, I guess. So in terms of climate and weather, I guess that's I'm, I'm just ex- uh, gravitate towards the ex- extreme uh, extreme areas, but. I like that. That's that's funny because you really are in extremes. I mean, that's you know, it's uh, I'm I'm not thinking there's much colder than North Dakota. I've been to Alaska, but it's a little different because you're up there in the with waters and stuff like that, not far from the shores. Um, so North Dakota to to nice, depending on where in Texas. I've been to different places in Texas, and boy, there's Texas hot. Yes, <laughs> nice. Well, good stuff. I all right, so. Let's talk a little bit about what Sydney is, and there's a there's a story that goes with the name. So if you could share that as well, yeah. So uh, it's 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 not an acronym. It, it appears to be an acronym, but it's uh, it's close to an acronym. It's seeing is believing me, uh, which to me is about 
self-reflection and, and, and so, so the way we started Sydney back in 2012 ish, um, I was actually a classroom teacher. So I, I, I built it out of my classroom and, uh, and I believe that, uh, self-reflection was really sort of the way to, you know, like in anything, any pursuit, uh, it's just the way, uh, the self-awareness and, and the way to sort of in terms of growth and improvement, uh, being able to recognize sort of what you're good at and maybe some of the things that you need to work at, uh, really it's about self-reflection. It's really the, you know, most powerful form of professional growth. So Sydney is all about reflection, um, and, and sort of being self-aware, uh, as a professional. Um, and that, uh, it, I didn't come up with Sydney. It was actually uh, a friend and an advisor at the time. Uh, she was a, a guest teacher actually at the high school I was teaching at. And uh, she's like, well, what about Sydney? And I was like, well, I guess that works. Um, and, uh, you know, at the time, domain names, of course, are very difficult to get today, uh, but were also difficult at the time. So it's like, oh, that's short. Uh, that, that might work. So let's just go with sydney.com. So that was kind of uh, just very spon- spontaneous. She just said, Sydney. I was like, okay, I don't, can't really think of anything else. So let's just go with that. Nice. I like that. That's a, uh, that's cool. That's, you know, it, it's always good to have help. And then it's like, I, let, I like that. Let's go. And then off, off you go. So very nice. So you, what is that thing that just said, uh, this is the route now you named it. And, uh, but what is it that, it, that inspiration that just said, uh, you know, I, I got to keep doing this because, you know, it's, Many people get ideas about things, but the idea lasts, you know, through a couple of coffee and then a couple of meetings and then uh, they move on to the next thing. So why didn't you move on to the next thing? Yeah, uh, great question. So at the time, um, so the iPhone had, had, had just started coming out uh, with a couple of different versions. And as a department chair at a high school, I was, uh, you know, of course, advising and working with a lot of new teachers uh, in my department. Um the problem, the big problem was that we're all teaching at the same time and how am I able to support them when, uh, when we're all doing the same work at the same time. So, uh, video, uh, I was always a big fan of video reflection and video analysis cause I was a former athlete, uh, where we used video quite extensively to improve our performance and our practice. And, uh, you know, in a lot of teacher prep programs, you maybe get videotaped once. I think I was in my teacher prep program videotaped one time with a big VHS camcorder, uh, never, uh, never watched it, uh, unfortunately, but, uh, you know, when I was a department lead, we, we started doing lesson study and breaking down lessons and really film study, you know, and, and it, it was the most powerful professional learning that I had ever done as a professional, uh, educator. And I was just kind of curious as to why, the world was still continuing to send us to trainings and workshops, you know, uh, at, you know, after school, uh, where everybody's tired and exhausted and, you know, totally checked out and really not getting anything from it. Uh, but then when we would do these PLC sort of film study review sessions, everybody was super engaged. Um, you know, just dove into the work. Uh, it was really intellectually stimulating, and sometimes we would go beyond our required allotment. Uh, you know, we'd leave at five thirty, and people were really jazzed up about the conversation and just the the work that we did in that in super productive, you know, meeting and time. And you know, I never really felt that in all the trainings and workshops that I did. You know, up up until that point. So I was I just felt like there's just a better way to do professional learning, make it more job embedded personalized, uh, really the concept of learning and the flow of work as opposed to sit and get workshops, which, uh, you know, everybody talks about at conferences of getting away from, but we still continue to do it because it's easy to put on a schedule three, three times a year, four times a year. And well, what's the day, you know, we got to plan that day out and, uh, uh, what should we do? Well, let's just put it on the calendar. Um, but you know, not a lot of educators get much benefit from that. You know, it's, it, what's really interesting too, is that <laughs> there was a time when uh, I can remember sitting, uh, 
sitting in some training uh, before we had the technology to go with the training that we were having, and uh, which <laughs> even more interesting. So we're sitting in a room about this computer software without the computers, and uh, that was <laughs> that was impressive. That was <laughs> and effective too. Yes. Uh, so nice. I, I I feel for you what you're talking about. So I know exactly what you're talking about there. Uh, all right. So, all right. So we're going to be talking about AI and the impact that it has on education. But before we do that, what does AI mean to you? Yeah, AI. I guess to me is, uh, and I don't really think we have AI today. I, you know, I think that's what everybody sort of. It's it's really machine learning at this point. Um, uh, so in terms of just artificial intelligence, obviously there's this path where people want to go to artificial generalized intelligence. Maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't in our lifetime. Uh, some people say it'll happen in 10 years. Some people say it'll never happen. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, artificial intelligence is just in my mind is, uh, I mean, what first would came to my mind was it's robots. Uh, but really it's just, uh, an assistant, in my opinion, to aid human beings in uh, closing some of the gaps and like taking over things that we're not as good at in terms of, you know, recall and processing information quickly. So just being able to retrieve that uh, at a much uh, more or much faster pace and, and sort of uh, leveraging artificial intelligence to just make us more productive, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, close gaps on where, you know, we're just, we don't have unlimited human resources and human capital and schools and, and districts. And I think artificial intelligence has great promise and, and sort of helping, uh, move the needle forward with fewer and fewer resources that educators have today. Oh, I love that. And first of all, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, because you, one of the things I, I, I typically, when I'm going to be talking about AI, I typically have some, some question where I ask them what they think about it, what it means to them, or, or uh, is AI real or not, all right? Because, uh, you know, there are some people think right now that, we're in, that we might be in this planet where we're getting really close, you know, the world's coming to an end, soon there's going to be Skynet, and we're going to have Terminators all around us, eliminating the human population. And, uh, um, starting with the, you know certain jobs and uh, you know and there for a little bit uh, teachers there were a lot of English teachers that are thinking their life was over um, and then suddenly they went back oh this is okay I can do this and I think we're back in that planet again where their life's over but I'm I'm not sure uh, um, by the way um, not that there's anything wrong with being an English teacher that's not my point it's just that it seemed like that was the population at first that it's going to ruin essay writing and everything so you know I. It, it, it is interesting. So I have to thank you for your, your thoughts about it because, you know, there's a lot of people who want, you know, that's why they named their smart, uh, notice that I'm not going to say the name of it, but their smart speakers, you know, they even called them names thinking that if I call it this name, it's going to, you know, it's going to make things happen. And, you know, it kind of sort of does. And um, I mean, the, the creepiest sort of AI to me is the, are the maps things that remind you that, you know, you go home every day, and if you were to leave now, it's going to take you about three hours. And it's like, would you stop paying attention to everything? It's like, wow, you know, that's that's an interesting stuff. But thank you so much for that. Uh, what you were saying there, I, you know, because I, I think we're not there, and I and I hope that we never really get to that thing where it's you know a sentient being or something like that. You know, it's like a hmm, that's a that's an interesting, scary thing. But all right, so how are you leveraging AI at Sydney? Because you, it, it's part of what you what you do, right? Yeah. So it's really something that we thought about years ago of saying, okay, we have this video platform to enable teachers to collaborate and work together to self-reflect on their own practice. Um, so really when we started it, it was, was a video platform that we created ultimately to, to just allow educators to collaborate. Um, and we, I kind of, you know, even 10 years ago, wouldn't it be amazing if, you know, uh, we could basically analyze or, or a robot or, or an AI could uh, pull out some of these skills uh, that we're trying to identify um, because traditionally people come into rooms and try to do this manually, right? And they're documenting what they saw and what they observed during classroom observations, whether those are peer observations or uh, administrative observations where uh, 
you're trying to script, uh, you know, what happened during the lesson cycle. And uh, humans are pretty bad at that uh, in terms of just uh, noticing things, uh, bias, all these things come into play when, when we're, when we're doing a classroom observation. And uh, that would sort of incorporating AI would maybe eliminate some of this bias and subjectivity in, uh, in the way we're analyzing classroom instruction. Uh, so I thought it had potential. I, to be honest, in 2023, I would have never thought what we could do would have happened this soon uh, in terms of just what we're able to now pull out of act, an actual audio or video file uh, of what happens during a lesson cycle. Um, so we always kind of envisioned that it would happen at some point, but we started working on AI of, you know, two and a half years ago. Uh, so it wasn't like, Hey, let's jump on this bandwagon six months ago when chat GPT took the world by storm. Um, and let's get on this bandwagon. We, we were actually working on, on, on these models uh, for the last couple of years. So uh, we were kind of lucky in the timing of, we were about to launch it actually this summer anyway, um, even before, and I was always concerned about it. I was like, well, you know, how is the world of education or educators going to take this sort of to your point? Uh, will people be freaked out by this? Will they embrace this? Uh, or will they be totally reject us and say, get this out of here? You know, we do not want this. Um, so I, we kind of did a slow rollout with some of our partners and uh, did a few talks at some conferences this summer. And I was really pleasantly surprised um, by the audience and sort of their interest in utilizing this technology um, and not just administrators and instructional coaches, but even teachers raise their hand saying, can, can I just subscribe to this on my own and use this for my own purpose? I don't need to have some administrator use this on me, but can I just, you know, run this like a Fitbit or, uh, you know, if you think of health and fitness, it kind of, there's a lot of analogies to it. How about I run this on my, my own classroom and just uh, use these reports uh, for my own uh, professional growth. And, and that sort of hit me and struck, you know, I thought, you know, maybe teachers wouldn't want this, but I was, I was really shocked by that. Uh, and sort of very little sort of negative feedback that I've seen so far. Very cool. So, you know, how do you think AI is going to impact ed education? I mean, because we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about Sydney with it and such, but, you know, besides the, wor you know, the world falling in or <laughs> collapsing or something like this, I mean, I, I think we're at kind of a people, there's a lot of people waiting and seeing, and, and then there's others seen some possibilities and and then so what is it what's something that you think is going to be part of its impact on education i think uh we're already seeing it uh in the last six months of just uh i know many educators that are using chat gpt now uh to just you know accelerate and and get things out more quickly whether that's recommendation letters to uh, lesson planning and unit planning and sort of coming up with ideas. So it's, it's not like copy and paste really what chat GPT does is it's an, it's an idea generator that, you know, when paired with a human, a competent human and professional, uh, it works really well. Like if you're just going to prompt it and then, and then copy and paste it, then clearly you're not doing any thinking. And, and, and so using that as an aid to sort of make you more productive. Uh, a lot of the folks on our team use it in, in the corporate world. Now, I guess you could say in, in, in our company for marketing, uh, blog posts, uh, doesn't do all the work for you, but it's, it's obviously something that is a great partner, sort of, uh, you could say the partnership approach with this, uh, artificial intelligence that, uh, you know, comes up with things that maybe you wouldn't have come up with, but you know, if you're somebody that is a good editor and you can go in and tweak things, uh, then it's a really useful technology. So I know like my wife uh, is a physics teacher and she uses, she was using it and experimenting with it. Um, a lot of the 
of her colleagues uh, were using it, uh, you know, last spring. And, and I'm hearing just a lot of educators already using it this fall uh, to just, you know, there's a lot of stress in classrooms and, and, and uh, I think this is really going to help a lot of teachers, um, you know, free up some time. Uh, and ultimately that's going to be really beneficial. And then of course we didn't, haven't really talked about it on the student side. I think there's going to be, there's going to have to be a lot of education around how to utilizing these tools. I don't think it's just something that can be handed to somebody, you know, you could have said this about the internet when it first came out too, and just sort of uh, plagiarizing uh, work and, and copying and pasting. I mean, we all had to deal with that, you know, as educators, just teaching, uh, you know, when students would hand in uh, papers and then you would maybe run it through turnitin.com or one of these <laughs> plagiarism checkers. <Yes. laughs> so it's not like we haven't been exposed to this. Uh, now you could make the argument that it's a lot more difficult to detect, uh, but not really. You know, if you're an educator, you know your students, uh, you know, you have them right in class, right? Uh, you don't have them you you should know their writing style. You should know right. how they write. Uh, w w uh, so it, to me, it's not, I, it would be so easy for me as a teacher to detect whether that was written by <laughs> artificial intelligence or my students. So I am not too worried about it as long as you're, I guess, a professional and a competent teacher and you're actually giving feedback and reading student work and things like that. Uh, then certainly I, I don't see a problem with it. Oh, I think that's awesome. And, and, and you just hit the nail on the head because I think that, you know, one of the ways of solving that is just have them write in for, you know, in the class, you know, so they, you know, they don't have access to it, but I, you know, exactly. I, it, it's funny. I, one, I used to give essays in my, in my history classes um, and I would teach them how to write essays and we'd build up to a big one where they had to justify using evidence. They had to justify the point that they took the side of something they took. And, and uh, what was funny was um, I had, uh, I went to a student after I had collected these, and uh, I went to him, and I said, uh, I, I need to talk to you a second. And he said, oh, what's what's up? And I said, uh, um, tell me about this essay you turned in. And he, he said, uh, uh, yeah. And I said, well, you know, it has this nice introduction, and it has a nice conclusion, but in the middle of it, it says Mary had a little lamb, and it's over and over and over again. You repeat the little poem about Mary had a little lamb. And he's like, you read it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, it, exactly exactly and i think it's funny because what you're right you're so right about uh you know being confident it's like that that amazed me what he said to me at the first time you read it it's like well yeah he goes well i wasn't expecting you to read it I'm nice you know <laughs> yeah we got to read what they write so that we do know how they write and so you do know when it's changed a little bit what's what's happened here why why suddenly are you using some really big words or or not so much or whatever and you know one of the things i like to use AI for is to help me figure out how to say no and yes and thank you better. <laughs> yes. um, but anyway, I digress. <laughs> so good stuff. All right, all right. So let's talk about professional learning. How does AI enhance professional growth in the teaching profession? What do you think? Uh, well, I mean, I, so it's interesting because as I've sort of mentioned before, this sort of this evolution of our platform, um, sort of as a tool to collect evidence of practice, really, at the end of the day, it's you're collecting artifacts of learning, um, whether that's a class lesson um, or it's a, a lesson plan or a unit plan or, or evidence of student work. We just talked about, you know, are you actually reading the papers uh, and, and providing feedback? So how are you providing feedback to students? Uh, this is all really important stuff as a, as a teacher, right? Um, and sort of when you're working with others, um, I, had, I shared this uh, in my fourth year of teaching, I shared uh, a classroom with a master teacher for an entire year. And I thought it was pretty hot stuff coming into my fourth year of teaching. And I watched her, she was an AP reader and uh, Lang and Comp. And uh, the way she taught just put me to shame and I was so embarrassed having her watch me every day during her off period that I was like, it was just a, a very humbling year. Let's just put it that way um, for how everybody said, you know, Dave, you're an amazing teacher. You're great. Uh, but you come here and you're just, 
you know, I, I realized I wasn't that good. Um, and sort of, that was really a transformational experience for me and, and really also kind of was the impetus for Sydney and how it sort of, you know, so many teachers don't get this experience. You know, they come out of, um, uh, you know, their education program might get a little student teaching, but then they kind of get thrown in to their classroom in their own room and with not a lot of support, uh, and resources. Uh, and that is kind of a shame because yeah, you learn on the job, which is really important. I think most people become, you know, more competent by, you know, applying in, 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 in their classroom. If I went back and thought right now, I'd be really bad. Uh, and I would need to practice a lot more and, uh, I would be super rusty, uh, and, and it would be not great. Uh, but you know, so in the, in those years of, of sort of, you go into a classroom and, and you're kind of left to your own devices and you're kind of figure it out. Okay, well, great. Uh, and then you, you do some meetings with folks and you have really no idea, you know, how other teachers teach. Uh, you have no idea, like you hear stories during happy hours and things like that. And well, that teacher's amazing. I'm like, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, so nobody really knows, you know, you just kind of hear stories of, of like, this teacher is really good. Well, I don't know that. I have no clue. I've never been in the classroom, but I, you know, they, they seem like a fun person. They have great personality, so they must be good. Uh, so that, uh, to me, uh, you know, sharing that classroom with that master teacher for an entire year, I was just blown away and I learned so much and it completely transformed how I taught literacy, how I taught writing. And, uh, had I not had that experience, I likely would have been teaching similarly, uh, in my ninth year, uh, as I did in my first few years. So, you know, so you have to ask yourself how many other teachers have, are in that boat where they don't get that opportunity to work with a master teacher for an entire year. Um, and, and, and it was just, uh, it completely transformed my teaching. So if we talk about professional learning and professional growth, that was the ultimate uh, professional learning experience uh, for an entire year that I had the privilege to, to, to experience. And, and, and that was sort of how Sydney sort of came to be was, you know, how about we connect all teachers in their classrooms so that they can learn from one another uh, on their own time, you know, asynchronously uh, when they make, you know, they could be in their PG, PJs at home uh, watching another teacher teach with a glass of wine, uh, you know, as opposed to uh, four o'clock when you're exhausted and you just want to go home and somebody told you you got a PD day uh, or PD time that everybody's got to meet forced into uh, so that it doesn't meet you where you are. You know, it's PD done to you, not with you. Uh, and ultimately uh, that's sort of, where Sydney had this great potential to, uh, to enable that to happen anytime. Uh, and that was sort of the early initial, uh, idea of Sydney, but of course it's evolved over the last decade. And we now have instructional coaches that work within our platform to support teachers on demand, uh, virtually. So we have virtual instructional coaches and then we have, um, uh, of course, AI that, going back to the point of how do we save teachers time? There's not enough time to do professional learning. Uh, you know, you always hear like the biggest barrier to professional learning and professional development is, well, there's just not enough time. Uh, but when you think about it, can you imagine like in, in the world of performance, performing arts or, or in professional athletes, there's, there's not enough time to practice. Uh, I, I, go, go play the game. And, and that's kind of what, happens in schools it's you're playing the game every day you know for over and over and over again and it, without any time to process reflect and and really you're kind of reflecting in the moment and you're like well that didn't go very well so so there's a lot of uh you know sort of maybe if you're self-aware uh as a teacher and a lot of teachers when they first come into the profession are not so self-aware uh of of sort of where they could improve um, without a thought partner. 
And so that AI is now has the potential to be a thought partner with you. Uh, it can look at your lesson plans. It can give you feedback on those plans. It can give you feedback on your instruction. So the way Sydney set up is that it will pull skills from the audio or video file that if you record your class, it will uh, identify how long you spoke uh, versus how long your students spoke. So if you're talking 95% of the time uh, during the class and you're a really boring teacher, uh, it's going to be problematic, right? Uh, so there's no dialogue. And, uh, and, and, and some teachers are unaware of that. Like, I can't believe I spoke 90% of the time. I think Dr. Hattie's done some research on this. I think overall in classrooms, uh, teachers are talking about 89% of the time, which is just insane to me. I mean, especially if, if that's early elementary or, you know, uh, high school, I could see high school teachers think they're professors, but, uh, sometimes, but, um, but 89% of the time, that's, that's just a lot of talk for a teacher. So, the AI can recognize that and give you a trend line and a report. Uh, say you do it, you know, you record a class a week or a couple classes a week, you'll start to see a trend uh, in, I got to work on this. Uh, another one is like how fast you're talking, teachers' words per minute. Uh, teachers on average talk, I think, 177 words per minute. It's how fast they talk, which in some, you know, some research shows that that's just too, too fast for for comprehension, uh, for, for where students are, you know, so, uh, we have, uh, the types of questions that are asked in a classroom. So open-ended versus closed-ended questions. So if you're asking a bunch of closed-ended questions, you know, you're not really, uh, provoking a lot of thought, uh, in your, in, in your classroom. So, uh, a lot of, uh, teachers are just asking procedural questions. So this is just an you know, a, a way to gauge the level of rigor in your classroom. Uh, we have a flesh Kincaid report that will actually tell you the grade level that you're communicating on. So if you're a new teacher and you're, you just graduated from college and you're teaching fourth grade and you, and you, and you, and you're, you're communicating like you're a professor, that's, that's pretty problematic. So you're talking at a 10th and 11th grade level and uh, you have fourth graders in front of you. That's, that's not really age appropriate. So, so there's just amazing, and there's a sentiment analysis, like the, the type of language that you're using in your classroom. So is it positive? Is it negative? Is it neutral? Uh, you know, so it's providing sort of this objective data and report for you. But of course, again, it's not like, let me just look at the report and be like, oh, geez, what do I do with this? Uh, it's providing you the data, and then that's where you, as a professional, uh, can self-reflect, seeing is believing me, uh, and ultimately make some of those adjustments on your own. And if you can't make those adjustments on your own, that's where instructional leaders and instructional coaches and more experienced teachers, those master's teachers, can work with you to sort of interpret and understand those reports. Uh, within context, because again, it's within context. So it's like, well, you were reading about the Holocaust, so there is a lot of ne negative sentiment here. Well, I'm not going to judge you for that. Uh, that was obviously a read aloud, uh, and uh, you were, you know, so I'm not going to just take this report at face value. I'm going to use this as a as a coaching tool, as a as a tool to support professional growth within the flow of work. Yeah, it's awesome because, you know, one of the things uh, during my student teaching, I had the good fortune of being paired up with the department chair uh, of the school where I was. So even though it was my first year teaching, it was my uh, my student learning. And I picked up all kinds. He was a master teacher. And he was, it was so awesome to be teamed up with somebody like that because it took the theory out of classroom and, you know, you really were dealing with reality. And, and he did a lot of things that helped me understand uh, just different stuff too, like introduce me to counselors and seeing how the counselor department work and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, and it's, it's amazing because then when I got my first teaching job, you know, it literally was what you described and, and we're different. There's a difference in age here. And uh, you know, and I'm, you know, it's like, there's your classroom. Good luck. All right. And uh, you know, and you go about your thing and the, the only feedback you really get is when you deliver something, <laughs> And the, you're looking at the kids and you're like, yeah, that didn't work, did it? Um, and so then you have to make adjustment. And so you're relying on yourself to recognize that. And uh, that's, this is cool to have, the, you know, AI in such a way that it's a coach being able to get the feedback, you know, because um, 
videoing and stuff like that often didn't happen unless somebody specifically was doing um, that as a uh, an activity they decided on or you know they um, and this is this is so cool to listen to you because as as a as a coach to give you that type of feedback um, and especially looking at the types of questions and the words you're using and stuff like that because that's one of the things I mean I I don't know if you've ever taken time to I, I think the same thing needs to happen with like children's work i mean you know people will write books that are supposedly for kids and you look at it and you're like i'm not sure what kids you're talking to but this is a little uh little out there uh for <laughs> the, the level of kids you're gonna you're gonna make them all go you know and <laughs> fall off the edge of the map type of thing and you know and it's the same thing i oh i've run into what you're talking about there i come right out of college and uh, i had a i had a <laughs> actually as a student i had a uh uh, a band director had come fresh out of college who she was a trip because it's like, we really had not had the, the stuff she was talking about it. And she was expecting us all to have known that uh, stuff that centered around theory and things. So what, what a great thing to do there. Cause it, so I got to ask you this because, you know, getting feedback from, uh, um, from people is kind of rough for some people. They don't, they don't want to get feedback or they want you really just to say nice things about what they were doing as opposed to feedback. And, you know, so what do you think about, uh, um, you know, if, if AI, do you think there'd be opposition to AI given feedback, I guess is my point. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Uh, but like you said, there's opposition to, to human one thing we do here at Sydney is actually we we coach on how to give feedback. So this is not just a tool for for teachers to reflect on how to teach in a classroom. It's coaching conversations. It's we we coach instructional leaders. We coach coaches uh, on how to facilitate conversation, how to present, uh, you know, to to adults. Uh, so so it's it's a teaching tool for everybody and, and every professional. We we at Sydney use uh, uh, a system called Chorus uh, to record all of our calls, uh, customer touch points, uh, sales calls. We do a ton of professional learning within the flow of work uh, by reviewing and analyzing calls uh, and sort of how we do demonstrations and how we uh, do customer conversations and how we meet with customers. So, you know, AI is going to do so much in, in all professions and not just in education. Uh, it, we've already seen how impactful and just the acceleration of development and learning is so much greater with these tools than, you know, the traditional way would be like, go take this sales training course, uh, you know, and, or, or go, go, go do this course. No, now it's like you just did a demonstration. Well, let's, I'm going to review it and I'm going to give you feedback and, and you're going to go right to those moments and, and those teachable moments. And we're going to correct these things right now uh, within the flow of work. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how people improve is, is that sort of immediacy with feedback um, and, then, and, and then conversation. And I agree, a lot of people are resistant to feedback. Uh, one of the folks on our team, who's our director of virtual coaching career educator been in uh, education 40 plus years. She's like, you know, pe professionals don't, they don't want feedback. Nobody wants feedback. And, and she's kind of right. I, I, I think people ask for feedback, but do they really want feedback? You know, and, and, uh, Hey, I, I really, I really want your feedback. I want your, right. really, <laughs> are you just saying that? Uh, and, and, and I was one that would say, Hey, I want your feedback as an early career teacher, but deep down inside, I really didn't want their feedback. Um, and this is where I think uh, AI can really help in that for those individuals that are a little reluctant to work with others, uh, other humans, uh, maybe they're a little bit more uh, insecure with their practice. Uh, they can use the artificial intelligence to guide their own learning and, and, and use that tool to help support their own growth as opposed to being uncomfortable with somebody that maybe you don't trust. They haven't seen your work enough and, and, and sort of the feedback they're giving is really generic. Uh, it's really not that helpful. Uh, but if the AI can see what you're doing 
whenever you want it to see what you're doing, uh, it's going to start giving you some good data that you can work off of probably even better in more. So those individuals that are observing in classrooms, if they're not going to be using the AI, I think going forward, they're just going to be less effective at their job. So the professionals that are going to be embracing the AI and I, and I kind of say this now when, when we're hiring here at Sydney, I'm like, if, if they're not using these tools, why would I hire you? Uh, because I can h- hire somebody that's going to be 10 times more productive than you who's leveraging these tools. Uh, so I think folks have got to, just like they've embraced the internet and embraced email and things like that, they're going to have to embrace leveraging artificial intelligence tools to be more productive because you're going to be competing in the marketplace with folks that are going to be leveraging these tools uh, and just so much more productive than you. Yeah, that's so powerful. I mean, what you're, what you're talking about, especially when it's com- combined with some sort of coaching and, uh, you know, that it's part of the feedback that you're getting and it's giving you information that it'd be kind of hard to say that it's biased towards you <laughs> or something or uh, against you or something like that. And, you know, and it's, uh, but I, 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 you know, just, the, the AI from Sydney attached to the coaching is just, I, I can just see how powerful that would be. Cause that's, you know, a lot of times, like I was saying before, I mean, a lot of times the feedback you got it, um, was either from the kid's reaction or lack thereof, or um, because, uh, you know, if you're honest with yourself, you realize that, uh, oh, you're not getting back the results from um, assessments and things like this that you should have been getting. But that's if you're honest with yourself. Like you were talking about the competency of the person. You know, some people that's, you know, I taught it, they didn't get it, so I just move on. You know, that type of thing, which is scary in itself. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a it's it's a cool thing to be able to, uh, to leverage that information with coaching so that uh, someone can. Because I've actually had to have meetings with people where, you know, you try not to do this as a principle, but uh, when you use coaches, you know, if someone is being difficult with the coach, then you have to step in and, you know, do the, you know, kind of Darth Vader thing or something here, you know, <laughs> you, you will take this or you know, whatever. I don't, you know, the, yeah. the, the point is, is that I had to, and it's like, you know, so then it, it, coaching is not meant to be a threat, but then when I have to threaten you in order to do it right, um, to, to participate in it. And so it, it seems like it would be, make it a little less threatening also, if you're talking with them about doing that. Uh, good stuff. I, you know, one of the things, uh, uh, that you've kind of mentioned a little bit about this and so forth, you know, something that can be contentious is teacher evaluations. I mean, do you see Sydney working and the AI kind of working in, in hand to help teachers better with their evaluations and such, or schools systems creating a better evaluation system? Uh, personally, uh, you know, for somebody that's been evaluated multiple times in, in, in classroom, uh, I never took them very seriously. It was something to just kind of, get through. And I, you know, even my wife who was evaluated last year, last spring, uh, it just seemed like it's the, it's no different than when I was in the classroom a decade ago. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's the same process of, uh, a few times a year. I actually wrote an interesting blog post about this. Um, really I would hopefully, I think a teacher evaluation should greatly evolve to be, uh, something where teachers, are putting their best foot forward and collecting evidence of their practice uh, and not having these sort of three observations or four observations for th- 20, 30 minutes a year where you're seeing less than 1% of their body of work. Uh, you would think that we would move to a place where it's more of a portfolio approach where you're putting together your practice uh, and then having a dialogue around that. I personally would be an advocate because I think teacher evaluation would be much more fair with artificial intelligence. And, but again, not in the way that we've traditionally, traditionally done teacher observations and evaluation. I I just think that's a really antiquated way to evaluate a teacher's practice. Uh, You know, if I could wave a magic magic wand and change policy, I would say that every teacher should be able to put a portfolio together of their work. Um, and put their best foot forward as opposed to sort of these arbitrary, you know, points during the year where somebody comes in and documents what's going on in that classroom. That's just not a great way with the technology that we have today is really kind of just a dumb way of doing 
teacher evaluation. So uh, I think there's great potential uh, in reimagining how we do teacher evaluation first and foremost. But if you were to take this tool and use it the way we do teacher evaluation in most districts, then I would not be a fan of it. I would not be a, a proponent of it because I think it could be misused and abused, uh, you know, and, and just taking sort of the AIs, well, this is their average talk time and, you know, uh, this is the report. This, you know, if you're just looking at the report uh, and, and, and providing some sort of judgment or score off of that report, that is not what I would advocate, uh, nor would I want Sydney to be a part of. Um, we've always been a platform for professional growth and coaching and collaboration. We've never really been an evaluation system or platform, not to say that Sydney couldn't be used for that. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of the traditional evaluation model. So I would advocate any district that would be, uh, interested in this for teacher evaluation. I would say, show me what you're currently doing. And, and if it's like, most districts, I would say absolutely not. Don't do it. <laughs> I like that. But. That's awesome. That's awesome because that's there. You know, I have to say this because what you're what you're tapping into is that a lot of times what it becomes more is just a better mousetrap or something like this, and that's not what you know. You really don't want. You want feedback that helps improve as opposed to um, this is you know gotcha. Now you're going to get a two instead of a three. You know and. Yeah. Um, and that's because that doesn't do anything. Instead, that makes someone, you know, say, well, that was a lot of fun. And uh, then they send messages down the hallway when you're walking with your yellow pad or with your with your uh, tablet or whatever it is that they you're using now. And um, they're, they're coming in my room. They're coming in my room. Oh, yeah. So uh, I heard they're on the you know, I heard they're observing today. Oh, yes. geez, I, be I better better pull out the, the, the lesson that I that I've rehearsed 17 times. So, exactly. There's yeah. nothing better than when yeah. you know there's a problem. When you walk into a classroom and uh, with the evaluation system is what I mean. All right. When you walk into a classroom and the, and the oh. teacher immediately switches what they were doing because they're, they were, they're afraid that maybe they should be doing something different. And it's like, I've had that conversation with people before. It's like, it, I knew you switched because the kids all looked at you like, what in the world? Oh, Mileto's here. You know, it's like, it's like, oh, that, that, that's not what, <laughs> anyway. Um, you know, so it's, it's, you're so right because it's so meant to be about improving, but not gotcha and uh, scary stuff. So um, I got it, you know, as we're uh, getting close to, to finishing up here, you know, one of the things that uh, um, I want to make sure that uh, I ask you is how does someone, is it a teacher or is it a school system? How do they get involved with SIBME? How, do, how does that relationship get engaged to happen? What, how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, like most things, uh, it's word of mouth, right? I, I, I would say referrals uh, typically, hey, we we heard, you know, I heard about you at this conference or I heard about, uh, I, I saw this, uh, I, I signed up for a trial and, you know, I really like what you have. Um, typically that, I mean, most districts hear about us from somebody else, right? Like most things. Um we don't spend a ton in marketing. I mean, we're a bootstrapped education company that, uh, you know, we're just a team of former educators. Um, we haven't raised a bunch of money or private equity or any of these, you know, ways that a lot of education companies, we've really just grown organically over the last decade. Uh, and, you know, we only, if, if we deliver, you know, uh, school districts and schools will continue to partner with us. And if we don't, they'll cut cut it. So uh, you know, we're we don't have a bunch of capital behind us to to just sort of get it, you know, get get into schools and then just churn out of these school districts. So we like to build long term partnerships and relationships with um, school districts, ESCs, individual campuses, and then of course teacher prep programs. We're also working with at the higher ed level, um, and. Sometimes it just starts with a small pilot and, you know, we have a really amazing customer success and implementation team that would, that works directly with the, the learning organization to, to, to scale this and grow it, uh, you know, in a healthy way uh, so that you don't get the resistance from teachers and, and the pushback and, 
you know, we've done this now for a decade and we've just learned so much. We've made so many mistakes that, uh, you know, it makes sense to partner with a group like us because we just have worked with so many groups all over the country in just so many different ways that we could save you a ton of time in rolling out this kind of technology uh, and sort of generating value much more quickly than you probably would be able to on your own time. So you're already stressed enough. Why would you want to do this and try to figure it out for the next five years uh, when I, we, we can save you five years of uh, headache uh, and, and sort of save you from all the mistakes we've made? Uh, I love that. I love that. That's uh, cause especially because it's it's so much faster and uh, better. And if you can make it non-threatening, you know, where you're actually getting feedback. And I lo- and I love this. Uh, we're getting we're we're finishing up here. And uh, before we go, I, I'll have one more question after this. But uh, um, if somebody wants to find out more information, create contacts, whatever, uh, where where do I need to send them? Yeah, just go to sibme.com, S-I-B-M-E dot com. Uh, if you just Google that. Uh, super easy. There's a contact us button. There's obviously a lot of material you can look at before. There's even a free trial to sign up. You won't get the AI if you sign up for the free trial. Uh, We'll we'll have to work with you on that, but uh, you can certainly use our video tool and platform uh, without even speaking to anybody and and saying, hey, does this add value uh, to my work? Um, But some people like to just do things on their own and others need a demonstration and a conversation before they dive into anything. Uh, we sort of meet everybody where they are. Uh, if you're the DIYer, just go, go on the site, sign up for a trial and get going or uh, schedule a, a, a discovery call with us uh, on the site. And we'll, we'll certainly uh, learn just as much on that call about your, your program and your school and your district as we will selling you our solution. So sometimes we're not a good fit. Uh, so that's where we determine that in our discovery call is, uh, you know, is this something that you're ready for? Um, you know, are, would we be good partners essentially? And I think we've gotten better than better over the years with that. Like we used to just anybody that was interested, we'll, we'll set you up because out of desperation, right. And survival. So, so we're a little bit more selective, uh, now a, a decade later than we were at one time where we would just work with anybody and everyone. So <laughs> nice. I like that. Uh, so I'll put information in the show notes. So it's easy for someone to reach out to you guys. Um, greatly appreciate it. One last question. And it's just a question I like to ask my guests and it goes like this. Uh, do you have a, p- a teacher in your past who made a difference in your life? If so, who was it? And what would you say if given the chance to say, thank you? Oh gosh, I've had so many, um, you know, and I know a lot of folks don't have a lot of teachers that they, maybe there's usually that one, hopefully there was one in in your eight, you know, in your 18, 22 years of, uh, of education. But, uh, I'm going to say two quick names. Uh, it was my, it was actually my high school football coach. Uh, coach Berg was just super, he was my physical education teacher, but just an amazing NFL coach of the year, uh, high school coach of the year. Just, I, lear- I learned so much about leadership from him uh, and just how to run, a, you know, an organization and a program. And, and, and I look back today and I, you know, I, I recognize why his program, you know, the NFL recognized as, as, as being amazing. And having gone through that for four years, uh, completely transformational in terms of leadership, and then, of course, uh, my high school field field biology teacher, uh, Vince Ames, was an amazing teacher because you talk about le- application of learning, right, and experimental. It was six weeks in the woods and going, you know, into locations and camping and, and, and uh, just an amazing experience to, to be able to do learn while experiencing the world, right? And uh, we, we talk about making – learning come to life and, and, and the application of not just so theoretical, it was actually, you know, learning in practice. And, uh, you know, I, I, that's how I carried that into my classroom when we did lots of projects and, uh, and, and, and certainly, um, any teachers that are bringing real life experience into their classroom is so important. So Vince Ames and, and, and coach Berg were, and of course, many others that I'm not naming, but those two really stand out for me. 
Very cool. Thanks for sharing. And David, thanks so much for talking with me about Sydney AI, instructional coaching. And, you know, just it's so cool because it's all meant to help the classroom teacher uh, be more effective and, uh, and without the, the threat of, you know, the old school uh, of sending you out there on your own and uh, no feedback <laughs> or just to get you. So that type of thing. Good stuff. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mileto. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right. The opinions expressed on Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 are those of the guests and hosts. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.